민족의 기본 사명은 전쟁을 억제함에 있지만 이 땅에서 우리가 결코 바라지 않는 상황이 조성되는 경우에까지 우리의 핵이 전쟁 방지라는 하나의 사명에만 속박되어 있을 수는 없습니다. 특히 우리 국가가 보유한 핵 무력을 최대의 급속한 속도로 더욱 강화 발전시키기 위한 조치들을 계속 취해 나갈 것입니다. Sirens blaring in Western Japan as North Korea steps up its barrage of missile tests. Firing 23 missiles, the most ever in a single day, followed by at least six more tonight. We strongly condemn the DPRK's uh, irresponsible uh, and reckless uh, activities. The most worrying, a long-range intercontinental ballistic missile fired this morning. A South Korean government source telling NBC News it appears to be a Hwasong-17, the North's most advanced missile capable, in theory, of reaching the United States. Высокопоставленных представителей ведущих государств НАТО о возможности и допустимости применения против России оружия массового поражения, ядерного оружия. Тем, кто позволяет себе такие заявления в отношении России, хочу напомнить что наша страна также располагает различными средствами поражения, а по отдельным компонентам и более современными, чем у стран НАТО. И при угрозе территориальной целостности нашей страны для защиты России и нашего народа мы, безусловно, используем все имеющиеся в нашем распоряжении средства. Это не блин that a Russian missile or missiles crossed into Poland in a border town and there are reports that some people near a grain elevator were killed. So the headline is the AP citing a US intelligence official. Now separately, the, a senior or the senior spokesperson for the Polish government on Twitter a short time ago in Polish, but it's easy to translate, coming out and saying, that the National Security Ministry of Poland has convened an emergency meeting. That's what we know at the time. Today is Tuesday, November 15th. This is a recap for the stock market activities today. Now, folks, I got a good one for you tonight. And you know, in this channel, we try to keep it humorous, regardless of the circumstances. But unfortunately, in tonight's show, this will be an incredibly difficult task to achieve. And the reason is, we're going to talk about perhaps the most imminent danger to humanity right now, the risk of a nuclear war. But let's take it one step at a time. We know that this is becoming an increasingly geopolitical market. In a geopolitical economy, the global economy is reeling from high inflation, inflation that was intensified by the war in Ukraine. When we visit the wall of worry for the global economy and the stock market, we see many items here, including what's going on in DC, the tensions with China, the change in the monetary policy by the Federal Reserve, and of course, what's going on in the economic collapse in the European Union and the UK. But also, since the beginning of the year, another item that keeps flaring up from time to time is what's going on between Russia and Ukraine. Not only intensifying global inflation, but also we have the risk of this war spilling over and becoming something way bigger than the global economy can handle. Today, we got a dangerous development, and I'm going to walk with you how the events unfolded and then tell you my opinion about it. We started the day on the heels of some optimism. We heard about talks between the United States and Russia on high levels in the State Department, in the Pentagon, in the CIA, with the counterparts in Russia. We also heard encouraging statements by the Russian counterparts and the Ukrainian counterparts, indicating openness for a peace deal. Today in the morning, Ukrainian President Zelensky 
in the G20 laid out a 10-point peace plan with Russia, which of course includes a full withdrawal of Russian forces. He has to say that because he has an audience at home. But we know that the deal that they're talking about is giving Russia the Donbass region along with keeping Crimea. On the other hand, the Ukrainians will take back the two regions that Russia annexed. And there were a lot of hope that this might actually work out. And we have a peace deal and this massive global inflation that's going on right now, specifically energy and food inflation, might subside. We might be relieved, specifically in poorer countries, that we're not going to face a hunger crisis. But unfortunately today, we got the news that Russia pounded Ukraine in the heaviest missile strike of the war so far. And these strikes targeted critical infrastructure in Ukraine, and it spilled over all the way to Moldova, where we saw blackouts electricity going down, the internet going down. But of course, the most dangerous development was a missile or a projectile that landed in the country of Poland, killing two people. Now, Poland happens to be a NATO member, and an attack on a NATO member means an attack on all and requires a response by all NATO members, which put us in the path of World War III, a face-off between NATO and Russia. And immediately, the Polish Prime Minister convened an extraordinary meeting of the National Security Committee following reports that stray Russian rockets had landed in Poland, killing two people. And of course, our thoughts with uh, Poland and the Polish people, because some of the most passionate viewers of this channel happen to be from Poland. I have no idea why, but I'll take that. And hopefully I'll visit your country soon, assuming that World War III is not going to start. But things started to become a little more suspicious. Shortly after we got the news, immediately, the Biden administration asked for over $37 billion in emergency aid to Ukraine. Now, this comes on top of almost $60 billion of taxpayer money that was already sent to Ukraine. To put it in perspective, if we add the $60 billion with this upcoming request of $37 billion, the total becomes almost $100 billion in aid to Ukraine. And this number is way larger than the entire military budget of Russia, and certainly way bigger than the entire budget of the country of Ukraine last year. And this is very frustrating for the American taxpayer who is suffering from high inflation, unaffordable housing, homelessness, higher gasoline prices, yet we're sending billions and billions and billions to Ukraine with no accountability at all. The majority of the American public supports Ukraine and supports sending aid to that country. But there has to be some accountability here. We're talking about $100 billion. Who are the fat cats getting rich from these deals? A billion here, a billion there. And oh, by the way, in this package, they're also sending about $10 billion in uh, the thing relief for the virus, which President Biden himself declared was over in the United States. Who is getting rich from all of this money? We might explore the answer of this question in another episode, but for now we have to talk about what happened in Poland and the ramifications that could come with that, not just to the global economy, but also in how it's going to evolve the war, whether we're going to see this development dragging in NATO members into the war. Here's what I think, and I just listened to President Biden, who spoke just a few minutes ago, indicating that the missile did not come from Russia. So we have different possibilities here. Either it came from Russian forces within Ukraine, or perhaps a SAM missile from Ukraine itself, targeting an incoming Russian missile and a misfired landing in Poland. Or it could have actually hit the Russian missile, changed the trajectory, and it landed into Poland. We have no idea right now. But in my opinion, this is not a game changer. I don't see the war escalating based on this. And I don't see the global economy or the reaction in the stock market lasting because of this. But we must be careful here. Because any avid reader of history realizes that wars historically speaking, started for the silliest reasons. So we're not going to dismiss the fact that an accident could actually lead to World War III or intensifying the war and escalating it beyond the borders of Ukraine. Hopefully that's not going to happen, but we cannot underestimate that possibility. Yet what's more important right now is, today's action was a reminder of the greater risk. And this greater risk is if this war develops into a nuclear war, which is the main topic of tonight's show. So let's dive right into it, and here it is. In Focus Tonight... The most dangerous moment in history, the risk of a nuclear war. We start with the risk of a nuclear war, this time around from North Korea, because a lot of developments have been going on in this country. To begin with, North Korea has been firing missiles since the beginning of the year. We have rumors now 
that we're getting closer and closer to a new, perhaps the biggest, nuclear test that North Korea has ever conducted. We've been hearing the rhetoric being heated. For example, Kim Jong-un's sister told the South Korean president to shut his mouth, wait till this whack job assassinates her brother and takes over. The nukes would be flying all over the place. But the most dangerous development is that now North Korea has a new law, and the law allows North Korea to conduct a first nuclear strike if the leadership of the country faces an imminent threat meaning the Kim regime. And of course, we now know, after these dozens of missiles that have been fired so far this year by North Korea, that the sanction policy has failed. North Korea continues to develop its military to become even more dangerous by the day, regardless of the sanctions. And it is becoming clear that we must take the nuclear threat from North Korea seriously, because the American media and the public sometimes views North Korea as a joke, as a country that is perhaps not capable of following up on the threats of nuclear attacks. But after the recent developments, we now know that they're fully capable of conducting a nuclear strike. And of course, the Pentagon issued a dire warning to North Korea that any attack on Japan, South Korea, or even the United States will result to the end of the Kim regime. The question becomes, at what cost? What would be the cost to South Korea, to Japan, or even the Western United States? And aside from North Korea, the United States is now facing for the first time two nuclear threats at once, China and Russia. So we'll make that three. Forget about two. It's three. China, Russia, North Korea. The good news, though, even though we have tensions with China right now regarding Taiwan and all of that, and we continue to deploy serious military equipments close to China, for example, B-52s in North Australia, which is making the Chinese mad. We just got a meeting between President Biden and President Xi, indicating openness to resolving all of these conflicts in a peaceful manner. So at least for now, the threat of a nuclear war with China is delayed, and that's the good news. But the bad news is, the risk of a nuclear war with Russia continues to escalate. Just yesterday, the director of the CIA met Putin's spy chief, the counterpart in Russia, and warned them against the use of nuclear weapons. The problem is, things are escalating and heading toward a nuclear confrontation. Just last month, the United States and NATO conducted nuclear drills in Europe using B-52 bombers. Take a look. NATO kicks off nuclear training exercises in Europe. The pre-planned drills taking place in Belgium, the North Sea and the United Kingdom, involving 14 countries with up to 60 aircraft, including US B-52 long-range bombers. And of course, NATO said that the Western drills were not prompted by the latest tensions with Russia. They also said that the exercise, which ran to October 30, is a routine reoccurring training activity and it's not linked to any current world events. Belgium hosted the drills, which involved 14 countries and up to 60 aircrafts, including the most advanced fighter jets on the market and the US B-52 long-range bombers that flew in from Minot Air Base in North Dakota. NATO also added that cancelling the drills because of the war in Ukraine would send a very wrong signal, quote-unquote, arguing that NATO's military strength was the best way to prevent any further escalation of tensions. Unfortunately, the tensions continue to rise. Just shortly after the nuclear exercises by NATO, the most elite U.S. Army unit, the 101 Airborne Unit, conducted exercises just on the borders with Ukraine. Take a look. U.S. F-18 fighter jets take flight off the deck of the USS George H.W. Bush in the Adriatic Sea taking the lead in NATO exercises dubbed Neptune Strike in support of European allies. NATO released this footage of American F-22 fighter jets in formation with Italian Eurofighters and Polish F-16s, even MiG-29s over the skies of Poland. It coincides with two weeks of NATO nuclear training drills currently underway. While on the ground, we joined America's most forward troops near the Ukrainian go, go, border. Go, go, go. The 101st Airborne Division from Fort Campbell, Kentucky, now go, headquartered go. in Europe for the first time since World War II. With Colonel Edwin Mathedis and Brigadier General John Lubis, we board Black Hawk helicopters to the edge of NATO territory. Why is it necessary to have the 101st here? We bring a unique capability from our air assault uh, capabilities. It's also incredibly meaningful to us to return to Europe after 80 years away. With the Ukrainian border less than five miles away, we reached the forward operating site. 
where soldiers of the 101st and Romanian troops unleashed a live fire assault on targets in a simulated battle. And of course, the Russians responded by conducting their own nuclear exercises. Take a look. Well, Russia's military staged nuclear exercises on Wednesday under the watchful eye of President Vladimir Putin. The drills included multiple practice launches of ballistic missiles in what Moscow says was a simulated retaliation for any nuclear attack on Russia. Ballistic missiles blast off, a dramatic show of Russia's nuclear capability, weapons launching from land, sea and the sky, all under President Putin's supervision. Russia's defence minister reporting the drills, which are held annually, simulated a massive nuclear strike in retaliation for a nuclear attack on Russia. The exercise comes as Putin blamed the United States for its involvement in the conflict. We see in the example of Ukraine, which has become an instrument of American foreign policy, it has actually lost its sovereignty and is directly controlled by the United States, which is using it as a battering ram against Russia. And adding to global concerns about an escalation of this war, the fact that Russian forces are now preparing to work under radioactive contamination. And why would they do that if there is no real risk of a nuclear war? And adding to the concerns, a cryptic message by Russian President Vladimir Putin. Take a look. Strength is what the Kremlin leader is trying to project. This week, he oversaw massive exercises by Russia's strategic nuclear forces. A clear message to the West. Don't mess with Moscow. President Putin was reminded he'd once said that in a nuclear war, Russians would go to heaven and the enemy to hell. We're in no rush to go to heaven, are we? He asks. There's a long pause. Your silence is worrying me, he says. I paused on purpose so that you'd be worried. Now, listening to this statement, it is clear to me that the Russians realize that a nuclear war would be the end of Russia, the end of the United States, certainly the end of Europe and the end of the world. But what I'm concerned about is the fact that our media and the public seems to think that a nuclear war is winnable somehow. For example, you'll be able to spot the delusion in this article in a minute regarding an author, but the headline reads, the UN has said nuclear war is back within the realm of possibility. Here are the places in the US most likely likely to be hit with a nuclear attack. In 2017, Russian state media detailed how Moscow would annihilate U.S. cities and areas after a nuclear treaty collapsed and put the Cold War rivals back in targeting mode, a shocking threat even by the Russian's regime on extreme standards. Hyping up a then-new hypersonic nuclear-capable missile, Russian state TV said the Pentagon, Camp David, Jim Creek Naval Radio Station in Washington, and Fort Ritchie in Maryland and McKellen Air Force Base in California would be targets according to Reuters. But the latter two have been closed for over two decades, making them a strange choice for targets. And here comes the delusion. According to Stephen Schwartz, the author of Atomic Audit, The Cost and Consequences of U.S. Nuclear Weapons Since 1940, as the Cold War progressed and improvements in nuclear weapons and intelligence collection technologies enabled greater precision in where those weapons were aimed, the emphasis in targeting shifted from cities to nuclear stockpiles and nuclear war-related infrastructure. In other words, instead of targeting New York City or D.C. or Los Angeles, they're going to target our nuclear stockpiles instead. It's kind of delusional because if we hit him will hit the capital right away and the response would be hitting one of our cities. Anyways, he says it is exceedingly unlikely that such an attack would be fully successful. There is an enormous amount of variables in pulling off an attack like this flawlessly and it would have to be flawless. If even a handful of weapons escape, the stuff you missed will be coming back at you. Even if every single US intercontinental ballistic missile silo stockpiled nuclear weapon a nuclear-capable bomber were flattened, U.S. nuclear submarines could and would retaliate. But you're missing the part that our cities at that point will become radioactive waste. According to Schwartz, at any given time, the U.S. has four to five nuclear-armed submarines on hard alert and their patrol areas awaiting orders for launch. I'm pretty sure the Russians have them too. The U.S. has strategically positioned the bulk of its nuclear forces, which double as nuclear targets far from population centers. But if you happen to live next to an ICBM silo, 
Fear not. Nothing to see here. Stay calm. It's not a nuclear bomb, it's just the 4th of July. There is a 0% chance that Russia could hope to survive an act of nuclear aggression against the US, according to Schwartz. But we'll be dead, you genius. What is the point here? Anyhow, so while we all live under a nuclear sword of Damocles, Schwartz added, people in big cities such as New York, Los Angeles, most likely should not worry about being struck by a nuclear weapon. Um, do you have insurance for that? Because this is what Russian doctrine says. Take a look. According to Russian official nuclear doctrine, Russia would launch a strategic nuclear strike against the United States and all the NATO countries as soon as we witness the launch of Western missiles, no matter how armed they are, uh, uh, against our territories. And then the whole planet will die. Meaning, if we strike at them, they're going to strike back at us? and they're gonna hit our cities. And if there is no reason to worry about anything here, how do you explain the fact that the US purchased $290 million worth of a drug for use in radiological and nuclear emergencies? Why is it that our government is now prepping for a nuclear fallout if there is nothing to worry about? And folks, whether this is gonna lead to a nuclear war or World War III right away, that's up for grabs. Yet what we know for sure is, for all intents and purposes, World War III has effectively begun. This is at least according to Dr. Rubini, aka Dr. Doom. And effectively what he says is, World War III would be between the United States, Australia, the European allies versus China, Russia, North Korea, and whoever is going to join this alliance. And all what I know is the parallels are extremely concerning. Last century, we got a pandemic, followed by a world war, then a Great Depression, then followed by the Great War, World War II. Are we heading in the same direction here? We got a pandemic. We have a war in Europe right now, the biggest land war since World War II. We know that the global economy is heading into a global recession. Is it going to be a depression? Or would that be the catalyst for the greater war, which could be a nuclear war? Let's hope not. And with that, folks, let's move on to the coverage of the stock market, and we begin with the closing of the indices today. And here we go. The Dow Industrial Average in the green by 56.22 points or a gain of 0.17%. The Nasdaq leading the pack with gains of 162.19 points or a gain of 1.45%. The S&P also in the green by 34.48 points or a gain of 0.87%. Nuclear war optimism, baby. And I'm willing to bet that if we have an actual nuclear strike, the market will go higher because the Fed might ease the monetary policy. Now, it's absolute delusion. But anyways, when it comes to these sectors' performances today, at number one, capturing the gold medal, communication services, and at number two, for the silver, technology, number three, for the bronze, consumer, cyclicals. We're not going to shame any sector of the market today because all of them managed to close in the green, believe it or not. When it comes to the advance to decline ratios, the NY ISE 74% advancing versus 24% declining. The Nasdaq 64% advancing versus 34% declining. When it comes to commodities, the dollar was pretty much muted. Initially, it was down big in the aftermath of the PPI report, the producer price inflation. But then when we heard about the uh, chaos in Europe and the missile landing in Poland, the dollar moved higher again. All in all, it was a good day for commodities. Crude oil scored gains the WTI of a little over 1%, Brent oil with gains of almost three quarters of a percent, heating oil scored gains of a little over two and a quarter percent, and the party boy, natural gas, closing the day with gains of almost 4%. The laggard was gasoline, the RBOB down almost half a percentage point for the day. But when it comes to softs, muted reaction in cocoa futures, yet the majority of futures and softs in the green, big gains for con futures over 4%. Likewise, lumber gains of almost 4.5%. The ratty and sugar goes on, adding gains of a little over 2.25%. Likewise, OJ futures with gains of almost one and a quarter percent. On the other hand, the laggard remains coffee futures. On the heels of news from Brazil, the supply is a lot better, the weather is a lot better, coffee futures are down by almost 3.5% today. When it comes to metals, muted reaction for gold, but silver down about 2%. So is silver saying that the dollar has bottomed for now and it's about to move higher? We'll see. It is certainly the same message by platinum and copper, both in the red for the day. On the other hand, palladium winning big with gains of almost 3.3% for the day. When it comes to meats, a muted reaction from live cattle futures. On the other hand, feeder cattle futures down almost 1.5% for the day, yet lean hogs scoring gains 
worth three quarters of a percent. And it was a good day for grains, despite the news that we got that perhaps the deal between Russia and Ukraine is back on, which is really ironic considering the news that we got today coming from Poland. But anyhow, green across the board, be it soybeans, soybean meal, soybean oil, corn, gains of almost one and a half percent. Wheat was also up along with oats. Yet the laggards, led by rough rice, down almost three quarters of a percent, and canola slightly in the red, bead on the flat line. Moving on to the big casino, the options market, what's going on here? We're waiting and waiting and waiting for the gamma squeeze part in the bear market rally. Today we got the volume elevated higher, and we got more buying of calls, and therefore I cautioned the bears from jumping into shorting the market prematurely. Yes, we got bad news from Poland today. Yes, the VIX went higher, but by the end of the day, it cooled down. The momentum right now is on the side of bulls, because they got two pieces of evidence to support the rally. The CPI, the PPI, they're all up month over month, but they're cooling down. And this is good enough for the bulls to say, hey, Fed, it's enough, time to pause. Of course, the Fed is not going to pause. The Fed might reduce interest rate hikes from 75 to 50. But Jay Powell explained that this doesn't matter because he's looking at the ultimate rate, how high it's going to go, and it went higher, and how long are they going to hold the rate at this restrictive level. The pace doesn't matter anymore. But the bulls are excited. Let them get excited. They're going to get hit with reality the higher this rally goes. But here it is, the hottest table by far, Tesla, with around 2 million contracts traded today. About 60% of those were calls. At a number 2, Amazon, with around 1.5 million contracts traded today, about 69% of those were calls. At a number 3, Apple, with around 1.3 million contracts traded today, about 54.5% of those were calls. On to the unusual activities that took place in the options market today. And we start with the ticker BABA -B -A Alibaba. We continue to hear good news from China regarding the reopening, it's easing of some restrictions. It is not an official statement of removing the uh, thing policy altogether. So some of this excitement is also premature. Yet the retail crowd right now finds opportunity in these Chinese names and they're buying them, at least using call options. And in this case, somebody sees major upside coming for the name and they bought the 90 bucks calls for the expiration date, December 2nd, with expectations that Alibaba could score gains of more than 13.5% by then. And they paid around two bucks a piece. Tanner, this trade, all in all, spending around four million dollars. And then what about the ticker triple Qs for the Nasdaq? Somebody sees the rally continuing, and they bought the 306 calls for the expiration date, December 2nd, with expectations that the name could score gains of more than six percent by then. They paid around one buck and twenty-five cents a piece. Tanner, this trade, all in all, spending around one point three million dollars. And here's an interesting trade for LMT Lockheed Martin. Now I announced that I got rid of almost 50% of my shares last week. And what do you know immediately we have World War 3. But I insist that today's action is not really a major development. And if you're going all in buying LMT calls, be careful here because the premiums went significantly higher. The likelihood is if this is a no big deal, it's just an accident, no reaction by NATO, LMT will continue to go down. Because I've been telling you, I'm hearing serious talks between the US and Russia on high levels that we could see at least a pause of the war, somewhat of a deal, somewhat of a de-escalation move. Whether that happens or not, it will add downward pressure on LMT. But this is really an interesting trade because you can interpret it either way. You can look at it as somebody seeing a major move coming for LMT and they're buying both calls and puts out of the money. On the other hand, somebody's using the volatility and the increase in premiums to capture some credit here and they're selling both calls and puts. Another way you can read it is somebody who likes the name, they're selling a put meaning they're willing to buy LMT at that particular price if it goes down there, but they're using the premiums from selling these puts to finance buying upside calls. And this is how I'm going to cover it for now. Somebody sold the 410 puts and they bought the 510 calls for the expiration date, January 20. Now they paid around six bucks a piece for buying the 510 calls and they received in credit about five bucks a piece from selling the 410 puts. All in all, the entry cost for this trade is one buck a piece. And all in all, they spent about $850,000. Now, if you read the trade this way, it means this somebody is willing to buy LMT at 410. If it goes down there, they see an opportunity. But for now, they also see an upside coming and they're willing to finance the calls by selling these puts. It's a smart strategy and it's exactly how I see Lockheed Martin. If it goes down, 
I'm putting it back in in my portfolio. Continuing with interesting trades, what about the ticker SLB for Schlumberger? One of my favorite names, a name in my portfolio, and I love the name. Why not? It made me a lot of money recently. And here we have somebody seeing more upside coming for SLB. And they bought the 57 and a half calls for the expiration date, January 20. With expectations that the name could add gains worth more than 5% by then. And they paid around 3 bucks a piece. Stanner, this trade all in all, spending around $1.4 million. And lastly, what about the ticker BX Blackstone? A name that I happen to be shorting. Of course, it popped higher, significantly higher on the news that we have a Fed pivot. And of course, yields went down. This is good for real estate. And therefore, Blackstone rebounded significantly higher. I see this as an opportunity to add to my shorts. And somebody here agrees. They bought the 82 and a half puts for the expiration date, December 16. With expectations, the Blackstone could lose more than 15 and a half percent of its value by then. They paid around one buck a piece. Stanner, this trade all in all, spending around $450,000. On to the heat map analysis. What's going on here? Every time we get this uh, pivot optimism, what happens? They dump the winners. They move to the losers. They move to the RKK types. They move to the tech cohort. They move to the communication services types. The losers year to date. The Chinese names. And they dump the winners. The healthcare names. The consumer defensive names. Even the big pharma. The big oil names. They get dumped. But my view remains that the Fed might reduce the pace of interest rate hikes, but inflation is not going to waver, and the ultimate rate will go higher, and this will be bad for tech, and it will be an opportunity for big pharma, for the consumer defensives, for the defense contractors, for big oil. Maybe not right away, you gotta wait for this bear market stupidity to be over. But for now, the majority of the gains happen in the tech, the communication services, the Chinese names, the cyclicals, the reopening names, along with some of the giant retailers, of course, in the heels of Walmart reporting earnings, and the earnings were better than expected. With inflation, folks flocked to Walmart looking for deals, and therefore Walmart shot up higher. Along with it, Costco, Target, Dollar General all scored massive gains for the day. We also have a major mover in Taiwan Semi, which excited NVIDIA and AMD and the rest of them. And the reason is the big buffet. Warren Buffett is adding a massive stake worth $4 billion in Taiwan Semi. Now look, I I don't think that this is a Warren Buffett trade. I think this is a Berkshire Hathaway trade. I know for sure that uh, Warren Buffett was responsible for Oxy, Occidental Petroleum. That was Warren Buffett. But Taiwan, I'm not really sure. It might be Munger. It might be somebody else. But with the CHIP Act and moving the manufacturing of chips from Taiwan to the US, that weakens the position of TSM, not strengthening it. So I disagree here with the Big Buffet or Berkshire Hathaway. I don't think this is a good buy. And then we have news from Google, YouTube, and these geniuses, of course, in their own pursuit of the metaverse version, which is uh, the shorts, these YouTube shorts, a dumb idea. There is TikTok for that. They're pouring billions and billions of dollars in amplifying shorts. They're asking content producers like me, stop producing long videos. You're not going to make money from those, the money is in shorter videos, such as, hey folks, here's a chart, it might go up, might go down. Goodbye. You want that kind of content? Because this is what YouTube wants. And they're going to pour billions and billions of dollars. And then at some point, they're going to realize that the so-called short audience is in TikTok. They have no interest in moving in YouTube. Stupidity at mass scale here. And then what about the heat map for the ETFs? Mostly in the green, with very few exceptions in healthcare in uh, biotech, but the gains were led by oil, XOP, chips, the SMH, and of course, internationals, China on the reopening optimism, emerging markets, EEM was up over two and a quarter percent today. Growth continues to outperform value, at least during this uh, bear market rally. But do we see any alarming signs here that this could be over soon? Sure, we could see the GDX down, Gold miners, we see the SLV silver down, indicating that perhaps the dollar is bottoming. But once the dollar starts to move higher, the bear market rally will frizzle out. Let's move on to charts and we begin with the SPY, the S&P 500, 30 minutes chart. What do we see here? I caution not to fight the bear market rally because you're going to get trapped. It's not over yet. The momentum remains on the side of bulls, even though the charts are stalling. It appears that the chart is running out of gas. The one thing we see is a negative divergence on the RSI, at least in the 30. Another way we could look at it is the chart initially gapped higher above 398, but then came the news out of Poland and the chart lost that support. By the end of the day, it did climb it back. This is a warning sign for the bears, but it's also forming what it appears to be a bear flag pattern. 
It's a weak one. It's not a definitive one, but we can also look at it as a reverse ABC pattern. But again, even if the reverse ABC plays out and the chart goes all the way down to 391, that doesn't mean anything at all. It doesn't mean that the bear market rally is over. Because when we look at the daily chart for the S&P continuous contract, what do we see here? Bullish consolidation. Consolidation in a bull flag shape. Now, if the chart loses 3,960, even if that happens, the bear market rally is still intact. If we lose 3,855, okay, now we're talking. Better yet, of course, if the rally frizzles out and we go all the way down to 3,720 and a half, that would be the end of the bear market rally and the retest of 3,600 once again. For now, the volume indicates that the bear market rally is not over. The momentum indicators, be it the RSI or the MACD, indicate that the bear market rally is not over. When we look at the Qs, the NASDAQ, similar shape with the SPY, you could look at it as a bear flag pattern. You could look at it as a reverse ABC in the making. Of course, the chart could not climb 290 by the end of the day. Notice the difference here. The SPY managed to climb the support that it lost initially. The Qs, different story here. It couldn't make it above 290. And if the ABC pattern continues, we go down to 284.26. But again, does that mean the end of the bear market rally? Not really. We still have a negative divergence indicating weakness, indicating the rally is running out of gas, but if it pulls back, it could find support to reignite again. So keep that in mind. Here's the daily chart for the continuous contract for the NASDAQ again above the support of 11,689. No damage done. Now you might say, hey Maverick, but I'm seeing this candle. It looks like a reverse hammerish kind of shape. Isn't this a reversal candle? It could be, but with that confirmation, you can't assume that. The confirmation would be a down day tomorrow and for the chart to close below 11,689. This has yet to happen. How about the IWM? The Russell 2000, 30 minutes chart. It looked weak yesterday. We assumed it's going to go down to 183.25. What do you know? The chart gaps higher on the PPI optimism, but it's struggling struggles again to climb above 188. The weakness is here. The gap from the PPI did not change anything at all. If anything, it shows relative weakness. You got the CPI. You got the PPI. This should have been a massive rally today, but the IWM failed to make a new high. Another way we can look at it is, look at the similarity here. If we clean it up, this looks exactly as the consolidation from last week, which resulted in a pullback. So are we seeing the same thing here? My hunch is we could be seeing the same thing and a pullback is imminent for the IWM. But it all depends on this chart right here, the Dixie, the dollar index. Now notice in the daily chart of the Qs, we have what it appears to be a reverse hammerish kind of look. In the chart of the Dixie, we see a hammerish kind of look, an actual hammer, not a reverse one. So is this a sign that the dollar is bottoming, Qs is topping, you put two and two together, dollar shoots up higher, Qs moves down. It's a good assumption. But with that confirmation, you could eat a massive pie in the face. The reason is, look at gold. Gold, your boy gold, no confirmation here. It did not flush down today. It did not lose support of 1,763. Gold remains intact, at least for now. If it pulls back and we see the dollar moving higher again, then we have a confirmation. But absent of that, we cannot assume that the dollar is bottoming and the Q's topping for now. What about UK oil? Brent, a daily chart. What's going on here? No update. Still holding on to support, and of course, the tensions between Russia, Ukraine, and now the involvement of Poland, that should shoot crude higher. Forget about defense contractors, but we didn't see that. As if crude is saying this is a non-event. I'm concentrating on China. I'm concentrating on the reopening. I'm concentrating on OPEC+. Plus. I'm concentrating on the refilling of the SPR and the upcoming sanctions or price cap on Russian oil, and for now, it is holding on to support. What about the 10-year yield? What's going on here? It lost support, and it's now heading all the way down to 3.5. At some point, if it goes there, it's going to be oversold. We will see a reaction, a rebound, but for now, the trajectory is the 10-year goes down. Absent of a surprise, let's say from retail sales tomorrow, or another piece of data that comes out in the reminder of the week. Absent of that, the technicals say 10 year will go down all the way to three and a half. Now, if that is the case, and we've been talking about upcoming weakness in the 10 year and how we can play it, let's go back and hear what I said and give you the updates. Here's the 10 year, and the most significant pullback for the year was the most recent one, I should say. And it was between September 28th all the way to October 4th. Yields went down by about 11.5%. Here's how the IYR for real estate reacted a pop higher between September 28th all the way to October 4th. Now here's how utilities, the XLU reacted, another pop higher, although all in all, despite the pop, 
the XLU was actually down in the same period where the dollar went, where, excuse me, yields went down. And then here it is, the Home Builders ETF, the XHB, a nice, noticeable, measurable pop right along when yields went down. And here are the updates. We begin with the chart of the IYR, the daily chart for the real estate ETF. Since then, it scored gains of almost 13 and a quarter percent. It is now consolidating in what appears to be a bull flag pattern. If the 10 year is about to pull back all the way down to three and a half, we have another leg coming in the IYR. And this leg will be to the upside. Similarly, when we talk about the XLU for utilities, Again, a massive gain worth about 9% since then, and it's now consolidating in a bull flag pattern. The 10-year goes down all the way to 3.5. We have another pop coming in the XLU. When it comes to my choice, the home builders, the XHB, look at this. We got gains worth about 15% from that point on. It is now facing some resistance right here, but it is consolidating in a bullish pattern. If the 10-year goes down to 3.5, XHB will blast higher. The risk to all of this is if we have a piece of macro data that supports a more hawkish take by the Fed, we see the 10-year bouncing higher again. What about the TLT? Back in the resistance zone, is it going to make it? Not going to make it? We'll wait till the end of the week. But there's an important number here, 100.28. That would be stiff resistance. We'll see how it reacts. Most importantly, we'll watch how the 10-year yield is going to react. Because if the 10-year flushes down, the TLT will pass 100.28. That would be a confirmation that we have more gains in the XLU, XHB, and IYR. About the VIX for hours chart, what's going on here? It popped above 24.29, but it cooled down by the end of the day. Now this event, depending on how it's going to escalate or not, we could see the VIX moving higher or going back to 20, which is the original destination, if this bear market continues. Now, if we zoom in to the 30 minutes chart and we use a line chart, which outcome materialized today? The answer is it's not the bear flag, it's the reverse head and shoulder. If that is the case, the chart went down in a retest of 24.29 and it's now ready to move higher again. This is bullish behavior, not bearish one. And this is the only concerning chart that I have for the bulls. The VIX is moving higher again. When it comes to Apple, look at this. It's back in the no entry zone. Of course, it's going to get smacked in the face right away. And Apple moved down. It is holding on to 150 for now, but it is consolidating in a bear flag pattern. The RSI is showing negative divergence. If that is the case, Apple goes all the way down to 145. Tesla, 30 minutes chart. What's going on here? Holding on to the trend line, but forming a bear flag consolidation pattern. If this plays out, we could see a loss of support and a move all the way down to the trend line. Not this trend line, but the one below it. You can see that clearly in the daily chart. But for now, did the chart lose the trend line that it is currently holding on to? The answer is no. So we don't have the confirmation yet. How about Bitcoin for hours chart? What's going on here? The assumption is this is a reverse ABC pattern. But for now, Bitcoin continues to consolidate, weakening this argument. So the better argument is it remains bearish, but this is a bear flag consolidation pattern. Despite the bear market rally, Bitcoin continues to consolidate and struggle to move higher. While the equities market is finding buyers, at least for now, Bitcoin cannot find buyers. If the buyers don't show up, the sellers will, and we will see Bitcoin moving all the way down to 15,000. With that, folks, let's move on to the conclusion of this video. What do we have on the economic calendar tomorrow? Most importantly, we have retail sales. We also have the import price index, industrial production, capacity utilization rate. We have business inventories. We have the home builders index. And then we have a bunch of Fed zombies speaking. Uh, the formerly known as the king of the doves, New York Fed President Williams. Now that we have Evans, Brain Dead, and even Harker moving slightly toward the dovish side, will Williams do the same? We also have Waller who remains in the hawkish side, will he move closer to the dovish side or will he hold ground and issue more hawkish statements? We'll see. And folks, this is it for now. This is all I got for you. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. And I will talk to you tomorrow. This has been your host, the Maverick Wall Street, ending with a message of peace in this crazy, crazy world. Good night.